Front Desk, Chapter 19 Lupe and I became inseparable. Whereas before we were best friends bound by lies, now we shared a secret truth. I stopped pretending that I always wore long pants and long sleeves, even on days when it was 102, because I was always cold. The real reason was because sunscreen was too expensive, or that I was saving my cookie from lunch for after P.E., when really I was saving it for my parents. She stopped pretending she hated sports. Turns out she also had no medical insurance. She and her family were immigrants, too. They'd come over from Mexico when she was three. We told each other everything. Well, not everything. I didn't tell her my dad sometimes let people stay at the motel for free. It wasn't that I thought Lupe would tell on us. I just thought some things were better kept as secrets. Kind of like the security camera we didn't have, even though the sign said we did. One day while doing my math homework, I had to answer a question about how much money a flower shop made in a month. It was a fairly basic question, and I solved it no problem, but it got me thinking, how much money did the Cala Vista make? I never actually calculated before. Curious, I pulled out the ledger from the bottom drawer of the front desk. The ledger was this big black book my dad kept with meticulous records of how many customers we had each day. I ran my fingers over the names of the customers. On any given day at the Cala Vista, we had about 20 customers, including the weeklies. Mr. Yao kept the first 15, as per his revised deal, and my parents got $5 per person for the other five. But say we got to keep all $20 per customer and didn't have to share with evil Mr. Yao, how much, min- how much would we make? I lined the numbers up neatly on my paper and started doing the math. My eyes boggled at the numbers. 12000 That's how much we made for Mr. Yao last month. My parents, on the other hand, only got $750. At that rate, it would take them over a year to make what Mr. Yao made in just one month. Mr. Yao wasn't on just any old rich roller coaster. He was on one of those crazy upside down hair raising scream your head off roller coaster and he and we were there the people operating it for him. Of course, he did own the place and he had to pay for electricity and stuff, but still, the next day at school I went to the library. Can I help you? Mrs. Matthews, the librarian, asked as she looked up from the reference book. I want to look up the price of buying a motel, I said. Mrs. Matthews raised a sharp eyebrow. It's for a math project, I quickly added. I see, she said. She turned back to her computer and started typing. All right, let's see what we can find. She drummed her fingers on her desk as she waited for the computer to load. Looks like a motel costs anywhere between $300,000 to a million dollars. Did you say a million dollars? Mrs. Matthews nodded. Yes, Mrs. Matthews said. Even more for some of the nicer ones. Well, that did it. There was no way we could ever buy a roller coaster. Oh, look, Mrs. Matthews said, chuckling at the computer. What is it? There's an old couple in Vermont looking to give away their motel. Says here they're holding an essay contest to determine who to give it to. Mrs. Matthew said, isn't that sweet? Can you, uh, I swallowed hard. My heart was beating so fast. I could hardly get the words out. Can you print that out for me? Over and over again, I read the words. A couple in Vermont wanted to give their motel away. They'd been running it for years, and now they were both in their 70s. Instead of selling it, they were holding an essay contest. The deadline was not until after Thanksgiving. There was an entry fee, though, and it wasn't cheap, $300. But look at the essay topic. What would you do if you owned a motel? This was it. This was our ticket onto the good roller coaster. Carefully, I hid the piece of paper inside a library book and smuggled it back to class. I didn't want my classmates to see it. $300 was nothing to them, and a bunch of them were probably great writers. If they saw it, they'd all want to enter, and then I'd be doomed. 
I clutched the book tightly with both hands and walked back to class, passing Lupe on the way to my seat. I slid into my seat and glanced over at her. She arched her eyebrows. What's up? I shrugged my shoulders. Nothing much. All right, kids, listen up, Mrs. Douglas said. Today we're going to learn about China. A boy behind me raised his hand. Yes, Stuart? Is China in Japan? Stuart asked. Jason turned around and glared at him. No, idiot, it's not in Japan. Stuart shriveled in his seat. Well, where is China then, he asked. In China, Jason said. Oh. Mrs. Douglas told Jason and Stuart both to hush, and she started talking about the imperial era and Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. She showed us a picture of Qin Shi Huang. I didn't I don't know where Mrs. Douglas got her picture from, but in the picture, Qin Shi Huang's eyes were ridiculously slanted. His eyebrows went all the way up to his forehead. The kids in the front row couldn't stop cracking up. Every time Mrs. Douglas wrote something on the board, they would turn around and make slanted eyes at me and Jason. This prompted Jason to raise his hand. Excuse me, Mrs. Douglas, he said. I'd just like to clarify, I'm not Chinese, I'm Taiwanese. Okay, Mrs. Douglas said. Stuart raised his hand again. Is that in Japan, he asked. No, you moron, Jason yelled. That's not in Japan either. As Mrs. Douglas reprimanded Jason for calling Stuart a moron, I sat very quietly in my seat. I knew I should have felt glad that Jason clarified to everyone that he was not the same as me. But I couldn't help but feel a little sad too. Because now, when the kids in the first row turned around, they only made slanted eyes at me. Chapter 20 I ran up the stairs two at a time, holding the book from the library, the one with the essay contest printed out in it. I couldn't tell, I couldn't wait to tell my parents. Before I could open my mouth, my mother looked at my book and frowned. Another new book, she said. You should be spending more time doing math, something you can actually get good at. Then she became all nostalgic. You know, when I was your age, I used to eavesdrop on my brother's math lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have time for this. I'm not you, Mom, I exclaimed. The words came shooting out of my mouth, and my mom flinched. I'm sorry, I just mean, maybe I like something else. Like what, she asked. She put her broom down and crossed her arms. I bit my lip. I like writing. English writing, she asked, like it was the most preposterous thing in the world, like I just said basket weaving. I nodded. You heard, Mr. Yao, you gotta be native at English, and I'm sorry, but we're just not. Mr. Yao, since when was he an expert on anything other than meanness? You can, however, be native at math. I don't want to be native at math, my mom frowned. You're not getting it, are you, she said. She sat down on the bed and looked me in the eye. You just can't be as good as the white kids in their language, honey. It's their language. My gaze sank to the floor. As I dragged myself out of the room, my mother called after me. Someday you'll thank me. She's wrong, I told myself. I was wrong. She was wrong to the power of infinity. I thought about picking up the phone to call Lupe, but instead I flipped on the TV. A rerun of The Simpsons was playing. I stared at Marge Simpson with her big hair and easygoing smile. Marge, to me, was like the perfect American mom, so warm and forgiving that even if Bart was setting the house on fire, she'd continue chatting with her sisters on the phone. Maybe he just needs more love, she'd say. Sometimes I wondered what it would be like to have an American mom, just for a day. I could eat all the chocolate chip cookies I wanted because American moms on TV were always baking them, or making casseroles, or organizing birthday parties with themes. I'll tell you what they were not doing. They weren't pestering their kids to do more math. Whatever. I'd show her. She didn't even have to know about the essay contest. One day... 
it just be like, hey, can you pass the chopsticks? Oh, and by the way, I want a motel. Mr. Yao's car roared into the motel and interrupted my daydreaming. I flipped off the TV as he and Jason walked up to the front office. It's important, son, that you understand every part of the family business, Mr. Yao said to Jason as they stepped in. But I don't understand why we have to do this now, Jason protested. Do what now, I asked. Mr. Yao lifted up the front desk divider so that he and Jason could join me behind the desk. Today, Jason's going to do your job, Mr. Yao announced. He's going to check customers in. You've got to be kidding me. Jason was not a natural checker-inner, for one. He didn't have good customer service skills like me. No surprise there. But he also had basic problems figuring out the math. So it's $20 a night plus tax, he told a customer while his father watched and I stood behind them. The customer gave him a $100 bill and wanted change. Jason struggled to calculate the tax, which in Anaheim, California, was 13%. Uh, do you have a calculator, he asked. He asked me, it's $22.60, I told him. I checked so many people in by now, twenty-two sixty was tattooed on my in my head. Don't forget I need two rooms, the customer reminded him. Right, Jason said. He pulled out his hand and tried to do the math in the air with his fingers. So that's two times twenty-two sixty, Mr. Yell yelled. You can't figure out what that is? Hang on, just give me a second, Jason said. He bit his lip. You gotta carry the one and then add the... Mr. Yao shook his head and stomped into the manager's quarters. After Jason finally figured out the math and gave the customer his keys, he went to find his father. He was in the kitchen. I did it! I checked in my first customer, Jason told his dad proudly. His father didn't say anything. Well, how'd I do? Jason asked. Mr. Yao breathed in and out, looking like he was trying to contain a wild fire and was failing. How'd you do? You were awful. A disgrace. All that using your fingers to do math. What are you, five? Jason's face turned a beet red. Your math isn't even as good as the girls. Mr. Yao spat the words at him as he eyed Jason up and down. God, you embarrass me. It was his first name, I said in Jason's defense. It was his first time, I said in Jason's defense. Yeah, well, he screwed up, Mr. Yao growled. He stared at Jason long and hard to make sure his words sank in. I looked down. I could see the whites of Jason's knuckles. Afterward, when Mr. Yao went out to talk to my parents, I walked over to Jason. He was sitting all by himself in a corner in the front office. I knew exactly what he was feeling because I had felt it just a couple of hours ago when my mom yelled at me. It's okay, I said softly. Jason shook his head. Don't he said. I put my hand on his shoulder anyway. He jerked his body away. Just don't.